Hello, and welcome to the GVSU Art Gallery's On the Wall Artist Talk featuring Jason Rabondo, who I will introduce, or Eric will introduce in just a moment. Um, before we get started, I would like to read our land acknowledgement. Uh, one of the bodies of work that Jason will be discussing is related to natural resource management in Valencia, Spain. And that idea of managing natural resources collectively and the connection to the land, I think, is very important. And so for the context of this talk, the GVSU Art Gallery would like to recognize the people of the three fires, the Ojibwa, Adawa, and Potawatomi peoples whose land, on whose land we are gathered. The three fires people are indigenous to this land, which means that this is their ancestral territory. Every university is built on stolen native land. We are guests on their land and one way to practice right relations is to develop genuine ways to acknowledge the histories and traditions of the people who originated here first, who are still here and who tend to the land always. As we make this land acknowledgement, we know it is but an important first step and that there are many more that we need to take when we decide to engage in the important work of social justice. I would also like to take a moment to recognize our campus partners for this talk. A big thanks to the GVSU departments of biology, visual and media arts, the environmental and sustainability studies program, and the political science program, specifically their William Baum endowment. And with that, I'm going to introduce Dr. Eric Nordman, who worked very closely with Jason on the Canal by Canal project, which is currently on view in Lake Ontario Hall through the beginning of December. Thank you very much, Amanda and Joel, for um, bringing Jason here to campus. Um, Jason and I have uh, worked together on this Canal by Canal project since uh, 2019, um, and it's part of a, a book that I wrote about the work of Eleanor Ostrom. She was the first woman to win a Nobel Prize in economics for her work on collaborative environmental management. And one of the famous case studies from her work is from uh, the collaborative management of water resources in Valencia, Spain. Uh, their Tribunal de las Aguas, the uh, famous water port that's more than a thousand years old. So Jason Roblando is a professor of photography at Illinois State University. He has a bachelor's degree in sociology from Boston College and a master's in fine arts um, from Columbia College in Chicago. Jason has done work all over the world from housing projects in Chicago to uh, the Philippines where he was a Fulbright scholar in 2015. And he'll be talking about his work uh, in photography and his collaborations um, with uh, interdisciplinary folks like myself and the poet Joanne Diaz. So without further ado, I'll introduce Jason Roblando. Thank you, Eric. Um, I'm thrilled to be sharing my work at Grand Valley State University. And it's been a pleasure to share, uh, it's a pleasure to work with Joel and Matt, Joel Swart and Mandarini at the galleries. Thank you to your students for the beautifully installed exhibit. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today. It's been a meaningful endeavor to examine my own practice and attempt to recognize through lines through my projects, as well as share detours and dead ends. But I'm especially thankful to share the work that could not have been possible without Professor Nordman and what it means to work collaboratively and across disciplines. Today, I'm gonna to talk about completed and ongoing projects that demonstrate my interest in the concepts of place, displacement and community, and how people relate to the built environment and landscape. I'd also like to talk about the power of image and text as it relates to my own art practice and our collaboration on the work of Eleanor Ostrom. As I talk, I'll describe how I use my photography as a mode of inquiry, how my work has evolved from examinations of the local to the national, to the global, and the personal, as I have developed my understanding of the relationships people have with their community and the spaces in which they work and move through. The projects I'll discuss today are public housing, New Deal utopias, our work, modern jobs, ancient origins, home and away images from the Philippine of the Asper, La Ruta, 
Walter Benjamin's last passage and the uncommon knowledge of Eleanor Oshman. In much of my work, I use a combination of environmental portraiture and landscape photography in order to tell a story about a place. This is the Robert Taylor Holmes uh, public housing complex on the south side of Chicago. I'm interested in stories that both simultaneously document and debate history, challenging photography's ability to document human experiences. I place myself in a lineage of Walker Evans's documentary style of photography, rooted in socioeconomic fact, but expressed creatively and subjectively. I like to think my working method is akin to creative nonfiction. I'm inspired by Evans's work, especially his collaboration with writer James A. G. in their celebrated 1936 book, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men, a result of an assignment from Fortune magazine to document the lives of sharecroppers in Hale County in Alabama. Another guiding force has been the work and words of Dorothea Lang, another Farm Security Administration photographer like Evans, whose humanistic portrayal of the Great Depression resulted in images like Migrant Mother. In the body of work, American Exodus, this is a groundbreaking collaboration between her and her partner, economist Paul Taylor, who provided text. Together, they documented rural poverty of the Depression era exodus of migrants from the Dust Bowl to California. Towards the end of her life, Lang stated that all photographs, not only those that are so-called documentary, and every photograph really is documentary and belongs in some place, has a place in history, can be fortified by words. My talk today will focus on text-based or text-inspired aspects of various projects, which I characterize as a fluid combination of research, luck, and curiosity. I feel that photography is as much about listening as it is looking. And by listening, you gain context. And by listening, you gain trust. I met this boxer, Raheem, in 2002 at a field house on the north side of Chicago. He had just been relocated from Stately Gardens, a public housing complex on the south side. And he told me, I know that slavery is supposed to be over, but I have slavery on my brain. We have to live where the white man says to live. I thought this was a crazy thing to say to someone who we just met. I wanted to find out more about the community of residents who are being displaced. According to the news stories I saw, public housing and simple, was simply gangbangers and violence. But I didn't get the sense from the residents, like this one, who I spoke to in Florida. Every time I make a portrait, I think it's a miracle that someone allowed their photograph to be made by me, this weird interloper for the camera. And I'm very aware of the complicated ethics of the power of representation, especially when a photographer documents a race or a class or a community that is not their own, or a community with diminished autonomy. I learned a lot about working with communities during these projects. And I hope that my photos transcend these boundaries and the viewers too transcend these boundaries. I'm transparent about my intention as an artist and my desire to reveal a more nuanced and complex community. These are two stately garden residents that are sitting in front of a painted bench. They're framed by painted vines. At the seam of the concrete, there was, a painted, there was painted grass and they needed to bring out their own chairs to relax outside. They're a desire for nature, a desire for rest. In the social life of small places, urban design thinker William H. White writes, people tend to sit where there are places to sit. The spaces 
at Stateway and other public housing towers were unwelcoming by design. Little if any landscaping, routine police harassment, poorly maintained buildings. To me, this painted bench image represents residents taking, over, taking ownership over an unwelcoming space. I aim to inject metaphors in my work and point indirectly at larger ideas, such as the adaptive and creative resilience demonstrated by communities and the willful neglect by the city of these same communities. Over time, I became interested in the structures themselves and the land and space they occupy. Public housing projects are often referred to as warehouses of the poor, conjuring up imagery of countless spaces and cramped boxes. I thought about how I could explode this notion and portray residents connected to the landscape and built environment in the photographic frame, and sometimes with multi-panel images. In doing so, I exaggerate the horizon, expand the space that was already there, but also comment upon the fractured nature of public housing. My goal with these images is to establish a sense of place and to reveal a community of residents who feel tied to this built environment and each other. What the Boxer Rahim said to me has stayed with me and has led me on a journey considering not only what home means, but also how I think about the word shelter and property. How we relate to these words shapes our lives and memories. I recently learned about research by Nobel Prize winning neuroscientists, May Britt Moser and Thelma Moser, suggesting that certain cells in our brains may mirror in structure and shape the spaces we regularly inhabit. In cartoonist Chris Ware's monograph, where I read about this, these are like, quote, miniature sculptures of space forming in our minds to reflect the world as we come to learn it, end quote. Nobel Prize co-recipient neuroscientist John O'Keefe discovered in 1971 that certain nerve cells in our brain are activated when a rat assumes a particular place in the environment, proposing that place cells build up an inner map of the environment. Place cells, our brains are wired to be connected to place. I first thought that we have just an emotional connection to place, but we have, we also have a physiological connection to place, a connection that is removed or disrupted when people are displaced. I became interested in the power structures that were connected to displacement, people whose professions relied upon the wholesale removal of a population from valuable Chicago real estate. This was an attempt to depict the efforts to empower and disperse public housing residents. I needed to learn about the outside to understand the inside. And what I found was a matrix of people who were selfless and relentless optimistic and opportunistic, and people who just needed to make a living. This is my series, Outside Public Housing, which included demolition workers, this person, Greg Scott, who said, I supervise the demolition of all CHA units. The number of men I have each day depends on the phase of demolition. There's cleaning and stripping, there's the asbestos crew, the crane crew. I've been at demolition only for a couple of years. I used to be a contractor. I used to build homes. Now I tear them down. There was demolition workers, construction workers, housing activists, writers, real estate agents, or lawyers and also like bodega owners. And the series of models was modeled after the uh, old New York Times Magazine feature uh, called What They Were Thinking, which paired quotes with photographs, uh, which uh, my quotes revealed the inner thinking 
of the person at the time the photograph was taken. After Stateway Gardens was demolished, I continued my interest in the relationship between architecture and planned communities and learned about a public housing development on north side of Chicago called Lake of Things. This is the last image. This is the last building at Cabrini Green in Chicago with a sidewalk that goes to nowhere. As later poems look, look very different than Stateway Gardens. Uh, it was completed in 1938, built during the New Deal by the Public Works Administration. And there were red brick low rises with lush courtyards. And it was very quaint compared to the 17, 18 story towers that uh, Stateway Gardens was, the Robert Taylor Holmes, uh, the Reading Green. And when I started photographing here, in 2007, uh, it was vacant and 75% 75 vacant and boarded up. And it too was slated for demolition uh, and being redeveloped for the, the plan for transformation, which was the, uh, the ambitious and controversial plan to redevelop public housing in Chicago. And I wanted to show that it wasn't just brick and mortar. Uh, these were people's homes. And what uh, what made Lathrop even more special was the diverse demographic of the residents. It's a idyllic location on the Chicago River. And the architectural details. And the more I research about Lathrop, I found out that it was built in the uh, with, with Garden City principles in mind. And I didn't know what the Garden City was. Um, so I uh, looked it up and I found out that it was uh, this urban design thinker's concept. Uh, the, 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 the reformer was called Sir Ebenezer Howard. And he was an Englishman who was appalled with uh, the conditions in 19th century London. Um, the overcrowded slums of London. And he wanted to decentralize cities and combine the best qualities of town and country living and exclude the worst qualities as he lays out in his three magnets illustration. How it proposes the town country magnet to which the people will be attracted. Social opportunity, low rents, bright homes and gardens, no smoke, no slums, and cooperation, and no sweating, no sweating in the, uh, in the town country. And as I researched garden cities uh, all over the world, um, I learned about Greenbelt Towns, uh, which is the basis of my project, New Deal Utopias. So these were built in 1935, and uh, there's a person named Rexford Togwell who was one of FDR, uh, Franklin Roosevelt's right hand men. And he oversaw the project with near absolute authority over land use issues. And he was, he was a visionary who wanted to help the poorest third of the country during the Great Depression and introduce a whole new way of American life in the form of a more cooperative society. So they privileged communal activities, natural landscaping with a literal green belt around the community and, and uh, cooperatively owned businesses. And they were located, they are, are located in Greenbelt, Maryland, outside of Washington, DC, Green Hills, Ohio, outside of Cincinnati, and Greendale, Wisconsin, outside of Milwaukee. So I made lots of road trips um, after photographing at Latham Homes for two years. Um, I zoomed, I felt like I needed to zoom out geographically, zoom out conceptually. And, um, and I, want, I was very curious about these communities. Um, so uh, yeah, I found out about the, uh, why they were built, how they were built. And the goal was, uh, as in many utopian plans, was an ideal society whose citizens enjoy social and economic equality. And in my images of the towns, I meditate upon these utopian aspirations of equality 
the common good, the balance between humans and nature. And I engage with the egalitarian architecture designed to encourage social cohesion, as in this row of houses in Greenville, Wisconsin. I feel there's always a tension between egalitarianism and individualism, as no one wants to lose their identity. And here I photograph a series of similar houses receding into the distance, highlighting a resident who displays a beautiful daffodil on their house to stand out from the rest. And there are small front yards and really big backyards, uh, shared common backyards that open up the common green spaces, such as this one. And this again to foster neighborly interaction. It's just, um, and uh, and I try to exaggerate the, the, the natural aspects of these communities when I uh, went through them. With every utopian vision, there needs to be a break in the past, some sort of clean sleep. And here, the settlers are clearing the land of the trees and the brown people uh, to make a border for a fresh start. And this mural leads to manifest destiny. And I included in this utopian narrative because the stories of the towns and the stories of the US are messy, complicated histories. I chose this juxtaposition of the empty, freshly painted shell of the Napoleonic history mural to convey an eerie and sterile motif I've returned to throughout the book. When I saw these empty seats in Greenbelt Town Hall, I thought about power structures and who plans utopia. A power to plan is often in the hands of the few. And I think this scene would have made. Ebenezer Howard and Rexford Tuggle are very proud. There's people communing in nature to enjoy a summer concert. And I want to include this romantic summer life, like a uh, large scale of the blooming summer trees, almost like a Turner painting. But I should note that there was a bit of social engineering happening with the planners and the towns were built exclusively for white residents and African-Americans were to have their, their own complex built at Langston Terrace Wellings in Washington, D.C. And I initially thought this may have been due to a de facto segregation, true in fact, but not sanctioned segregation. But I'm currently reading an amazing book called The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein, who argues that the segregation by intentional government action is not de facto, but de jure, de jure segregation by law and public policy. And this is making me question utopian intentions even further. So I published this project with German publisher Kara Verlag, and it was a transformative and enlightening experience. And it was exciting to be part of a, a publishing process from hiring a designer to working with editors and publishing and printing in Germany. And even finding financial support for it was an enlightening challenge. And many photo books include essays. A specialist in the field and mine was no different. And I commissioned essays from uh, Natasha Egan from the Museum of Contemporary Photography at the Provide Artistic Context, but also a historian, Robert Leninger, author of Long Range Public Investment, The Forgotten Legacy of the New Deal to Provide Historic Context. In 2013, I was commissioned to do a series of portraits for the Oriental Institute at uh, the University of Chicago, a research institute that specializes in artifacts and from, the main, from the ancient Middle East. They wanted to make the objects in the collections more relatable, more accessible, and asked me to photograph people in modern day professions with a corresponding ancient Middle Eastern artifact. At first, I was attempted to do it with uh, color four by five film seen here. And uh, I started to collaborate with a former colleague um, at WBEZ, a public radio station in Chicago where he used to work. This person, Matt Cunningham. And I collaborated with him and he interviewed our sitters as we engaged with, and as we engaged with them more, they're reflecting on the artifact in front of them, imagining what the life of a potter was like thousands of years ago. And I decided I wanted to explore the early origins of my own profession as a photographer and do the project 
with the 19th century wet clay collodion process in the early days of photography. And I really fell in love with the results. This is a, a judge, Justice John Simon. He was a justice of the appellate court for the cast of the code of the code of Hammurabi. This is Patrick Conroy, brew and co-owner of Great Lakes Brewing Company with an Egyptian beer jar. And this is a real estate broker, Margie Smigel, and the Mesopotamian land sale document. So Matt's interviews are included in the exhibition catalog, and this is one of my favorite pictures. And um, while I was interviewing the uh, this person, the real estate person, uh, she was just in awe of this object, this really beautiful black tablet uh, with all these actions. And it's like, oh, this is so much better than these real estate paper documents and mortgages. And, uh, and I was imagining the person who made it, there's some some schlump in the back room with a hammer and a chisel. Like that, that's uh, you can't get away from administrative stuff. You can measure piles of tablets. Uh, it's like I can't stand this paperwork. So in 2015, I received the Fulbright Fellowship for the Philippines where I researched various aspects of the Filipino diaspora. And my family is from the Philippines, and I've always had a long abiding and deeply held interest. And what makes people move from one place to another. Also, I'm always interrogating the long legacy of Spanish, American, and Japanese imperialism in the Philippines. And for several years now, I've been documenting the global Filipino diaspora, a group of over 12 million people that leave home, often for many years at a time, in order to work and support their families, and work for and support their families in the Philippines. And during my time as a Fulbright, scholar, I, uh, I wanted to photograph the diaspora at its origins. And in doing so, I found myself drawn to the lingering effects of colonization, the toll that overseas labor takes on the relationships of families, and the nostalgic yearning that toll creates. And through these photographs, I, uh, I allude to a fluid Filipino identity, a physical and mental landscape born by and dependent upon traversing borders. I frequently contemplate the residue of colonization in ordinary life, whether it be a screen scarf worn by a Boy Scout, highway markers that commemorate the World War II Baton Death March, or people who swim in Subic Bay, a site that has been a controversial site of American military power. And colonization always requires a series of global transactions. And sometimes something as simple as a young man buckling his baron can be a reminder of the galleon trade between Mexico and the Philippines that lasted for over 250 years. I'm interested too in the larger forces of late capitalism and how the building, how the building proje projects that are meant for the wealthy and elite tend to dwarf and exclude ex uh, ordinary workers. And I explored the nostalgia that overseas Filipino workers and their families feel during their long separations. And the word nostalgia is particularly apt here as it comes from the Greek nostos for homecoming and algos which means longing, a longing that manifests itself in the songs that Filipinos sing during long karaoke sessions, in balak bayan boxes that contain so many gifts and essential items sent home by, by overseas Filipino workers, and even in the names that Filipinos give to their vehicles that pay for, are paid for with money earned in Italy or Dubai. Ultimately, I hope these photographs provide emblems of the depth of connection that Filipinos feel toward those who are forced abroad to sustain, to sustain the families they love so much. And uh, this is a Balak Mayan box, a big cardboard box, size of a micro fridge. And um, 
And I grew up these boxes in my living room. Uh, and Balik means return, and Bayan means nation or home. Usually, care packages that are sent to the person uh, who is away, and Balik Bayan boxes, on the other hand, are sent from the person who is away. Some objects that are sent as souvenirs that are particular to the country of origin, and other items have no particular cultural value, except for the sender's thoughtfulness. A Filipino Milan may send pasta and jars of spaghetti sauce, but a Filipino in Dubai may pack the box with household items such as dishwasher detergent, like this is, or tube of toothpaste. And these items, while banal, still carry emotional weight. And I see them as surrogates for the OFW's presence. A can of ensure protein drink is a signifier that a daughter can still take care of her elderly mother. Elderly mother even in absentia. And here's a picture of me in a bedroom in Dubai making those still lives. And I like to show this to my studio students to prove that they're able to make a studio anywhere. This is just one part of this global project and my four by, of my four by experience in the Philippines. And it's inspired me to connect to Filipino communities all around the world to find out what their lives are like. I learned about and met large Filipino communities in Milan and Dubai and Hong Kong, where thousands of Filipino domestic workers gather every Sunday in the Central Bank District to file remittances and socialize with each other on their one day off a week. And it was heartbreaking to see thousands of women travel abroad to take care of someone else's family. While well, the actual family back home is motherless. Capturing this scene, I pay homage to Alfred Stieglitz's The Steerage, his 1907 photograph wherein a man in a straw hat traveling on a passenger ship looks down onto the lower class passenger area. A class that is similarly separated by an elevated walkway. I've also become very interested in photographing the diaspora indirectly such as exploring the materials of photography itself, turning the Balik Bayan box into a camera obscura. As it is, the box itself is a vessel for items that maintain familial and sentimental connections. And by transforming the box into a camera, it can also serve as a vessel for memories. This is what the inside of the box looks like. This is a piece of vellum as a, as a focusing screen. This is an image from a current project that I'm working on as titled La Ruta, Walter Benjamin's Last Passage. And I'm collaborating, this is a, another image text project, I'm collaborating with uh, my partner, uh, Joanne Diaz, who is a professor of English at Illinois Wesleyan University. And the collaboration is a meditation on Walter Benjamin's last arduous trek across the Pyrenees Mountains in hopes of eluding the Nazis who were set on persecuting them. And we're both inspired by Benjamin's work. And we display the poems on vellum sheets. And they're laid on top of each other with a photograph and, and invite viewers to lift the sheet to engage with the photograph underneath. And we hope that the project draws upon and engages with Benjamin's own interests and the commonplace, the ephemeral, and the fragmentary. My products speak to the phenomenon of dynamic human flow, where the people choose to move or are forced into movement, where they move collectively or as individuals, where they are free or in servitude. And ultimately, I hope that the images show people, our viewers, the question of their own assumptions about attachments to home and place. And I'll end with the images made for the uncommon knowledge of Eleanor Ostrom, specifically these made in Valencia, Spain with Professor Nordman, where we researched the irrigation communities and waterways that have lasted for over a thousand years. 
And I was excited at the prospect of showcasing the work here, not only because of Dr. Norton's affiliation, of course, with UBSU, but also because of the way, uh, in many ways, Grand Valley explores and investigates the relevance of water in our lives. I researched the Making Waves initiative and hope that our work could fit the school's continuous exploration for a relationship with water. The images are meditation on how humans continue to shape the natural landscape, as well as a record of a thousand-year-old communal agricultural practice that has survived wars, dictatorships, and political winds of change. And I really love collaborating with Eric, and it continues to be a great adventure, learning about Ocean's work through Eric's research. And I love working with, uh, with Joel and Eric and selecting the images for the exhibit. And I'm glad to have the opportunity to show a few more here and allude to the photo giants burned and Killer Becker's hypological approach to the, uh, uh, when I display these canals and locks one after another, hoping that you'll notice the different, the, the slight differences in between each, each picture. And it's been a really wonderful journey uh, as far as uh, just a constant investigation of, of one body of water that flows and supplies to uh, so many people and the way they've arranged and agreed upon these uh, this common pool resource. And I used to work in, uh, in a hospital doing uh, lung cancer research. And uh, my, my boss uh, mentioned that to be a good researcher, uh, you need to go to dig uh, a mile deep and an inch wide. And it felt like that's what we're doing, as opposed to digging a mile wide and an inch deep. So I felt like we were uh, just following our instincts in one very particular way. But also, we're, we're, uh, we're kind of going about this broadly and applying oceans and following uh, oceans' footsteps in some instances. So, not only were we investigating the landscape, but also the people who make this all happen. And this is, these are uh, last few people were uh, farmers that we met. Uh, kind of happenstance. And I remember one of the pieces of advice um, that we got from uh, from one of the people, one of our contacts there was to was to listen, just listen for the water um, and follow the water. because uh, we didn't we didn't have like a roadmap. We didn't have uh, an exact plan of what we were going to do. Um, so we were, we were literally driving around and looking for reflections as the sun was coming up and uh, and listening for the water to flow because we didn't know the exact schedule. And I feel like that's a good kind of metaphor to how we should approach uh, our, our artistic research. Here are folks from the water court of Valencia that delegate the the weekly justice. And I'll end here. Thank you very much. <laughs>